want to separate the bad from the good. Hi everyone, I'm Em and welcome to Verbal Diorama episode 179, Train to Busan. This is the podcast that's all about the history and legacy of movies you know and movies you don't. And as always a huge hi, welcome to Verbal Diorama, you brand new lovely listeners to this podcast, welcome back regular or irregular returning listeners thank you for being here thank you for choosing this podcast out of all of the movie podcasts out there i'm so thrilled and delighted that you've chosen to listen to verbal diorama and what an episode to come to because we're gonna be talking about the history and legacy of train to busan one of the best zombie movies ever made And that is a bold claim. And it's a claim that I'm going to stick with because I adore this movie so much. And hopefully you're here because you feel the same. Before I jump into Train to Busan, I just want to say, as always, a huge thank you to everyone, everyone who listens to episodes of this podcast. And there have been a lot more of you in recent weeks Download numbers have really kind of shot through the roof, actually, in the last few weeks. And I'm just so grateful to you all for listening to any episode, but especially the most recent episodes that I've done. So I did an episode of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and also One Cut of the Dead. You'll realise that both of those movies are foreign language movies, and I've done that on purpose. Train to Busan is also a foreign language film, but... You guys seem to really love foreign language films because these episodes have just done so incredibly well. I'm just so grateful for you listening. Thank you everyone who's listened, who's rated and reviewed and commented on those episodes. I've had some wonderful feedback about them and I'm hoping that you'll feel the same about Train to Busan as well. And obviously last week I did One Cut of the Dead, which is an atypical zombie movie. It's not really like anything else. Whereas this week is a totally different kind of zombie movie. This is more of a traditional zombie movie with horror, suspense and terror, but also uniquely real heart and emotion. Crying at the end of a zombie movie isn't what you would consider the norm. But one of the terrific things about Train to Busan is how attached you become to these characters despite knowing that they will probably die, and a lot of them do die, but the fact that most of them die by sacrificing themselves to save their loved ones, it just, this movie tugs on your heartstrings so much, more so than I think any zombie movie ever has. So this is going to be a really fun episode, and it's probably also going to be an episode gushing over Gong Yu, because... He's a very attractive man. (laughs) I'm not even sorry. (laughs) Anyway, here's the trailer for Train to Busan.
Paul's father and workaholic hedge fund manager, Siok Wu, boards the hyper-fast KTX bullet train from Seoul to Busan, accompanied by his young daughter, Suan, to visit her mother. Unbeknownst to them, as the passengers are boarding the early morning train, a woman with a strange infection also boards. She is found by a member of train staff and appears to die before reanimating and attacking the woman. The zombie outbreak soon spreads through the carriages and Siok Wu quickly realises he and his daughter are in danger. But not only does he have to fight zombies, he's also up against selfish fellow passengers. Let's run through the cast of this incredible movie. We have, of course, I've already mentioned him, Gong Yu as Siok Wu, Jung Yu Mi as Seong Kyung, Ma Dang Siok as Yoon Sang Kwa, Kim Soo An as Su An, Choi Woo Shik as Min Yong Guk, An So Hee as Kim Jin Hee, Kim Yu Sung as Yon Suk, Choi Gui Hua as the homeless man, Jang Hyuk Jin as Ki Chul, Park Myun Sin as Jong Gil, and Yi Su Jung as Ing Gil. As always, apologies for any butchering of pronunciations of those Korean names. Train to Busan was written by Park Ju Suk and directed by Yong Sang Ho. The South Korean film industry is something US producers can only wish to emulate the variety and success of. South Korea, with its booming cities, wealth, opportunity and technological vistas, is often seen as one of the jewels of the Asian continent. Recent global hit TV shows like Squid Game, which lead actor Gong Yu also stars in, show a seedy underbelly to society in South Korea though, and homelessness is a huge problem in cities like Seoul. South Korea's transition post the division of the Korean Peninsula and the war that followed has been long and fraught. Two former presidents were indicted for crimes committed while in office in 1996, with one sentence to death. Both were pardoned the following year. A great deal of social rage was and continues to be directed at business leaders, the majority of whom remained silent and became wealthy while the previous regime was shooting students in the streets. After 16 years in power, President Park Jung-hee was assassinated in a failed bid for democracy in 1979. With all of this suffering and an ever-present threat to the North, South Korea's progress has been nothing short of miraculous, but it has not been without cost. While the rich and powerful got richer and more powerful, everyday South Korean citizens were struggling. Have you seen Parasite? Well, if you haven't, go watch Parasite. This movie, Train to Busan, actually did better in South Korea than Parasite, which is a little surprising considering how acclaimed and popular Parasite is. But bearing all this in mind, it's not hard to imagine that South Korean cinema, especially South Korean horror, tends to focus on themes of vengeance. While the South Korean film industry churns out comedies and dramas, it's the horror that it's most well known for internationally, and in most Western audiences' minds, that trend for ultra-violent revenge horror started with Park Chan-wook's Old Boy. And let me be honest, I have never seen Old Boy. I've heard about it, that's enough for me to know that Old Boy is probably not a movie that I would ever watch. I do know about that famous single shot corridor fight and I have seen clips of that, but Old Boy was so significant in the realm of Korean horror that Hollywood, well, they obviously decided to make a remake in 2013. And if Hollywood remakes something, you know they want to capitalise on the success of the original. And yes, I am going to come back to remakes a little bit later. Old Boy was the second in Park Chan-wook's Vengeance trilogy, again with the vengeance, but it became somewhat of a rite of passage for any discerning cinephile in the early 2000s, which is a test I clearly failed. But while South Korean horror is known for its themes of vengeance with a specific focus on female ghosts, it's also known for its social commentary. See again, Parasite. This brings us neatly to Train to Busan, which is as horror as horror can be, but it's not just horror. That's why I like it. And it's also the live action debut of director Yong Sang Ho. Yon was an animation director and writer, most well known for The King of Pigs and The Fake. He was also the editor, storyboarder and key animator for those movies. So this is a man who clearly knows animation. And it makes complete sense that he also directed the animated prequel to Train to Busan, which is called Soul Station, which I still haven't seen. It is on my list. I desperately want to see that movie. While his experience with animation would help with the CGI action scenes, 
Like World War Z, which this movie inevitably gets compared to, there are plenty of CG zombies, but unlike World War Z, which has its own fascinating story behind it and may be coming to a future episode at some point in the future, Train to Busan not only excels at the action, but at the heart and the character development. Yong Sang Ho most recently directed the TV show Hellbound, which is on Netflix. It was also touted as the new Squid Game. It's nothing like Squid Game. The only similarity is it's from South Korea. But Hellbound has a similarly interesting concept, this time about angels who materialise and decree that an individual is bound for hell at a specific time and date in the future. But it asks some really important questions, like are only sinners sent to hell and what is the definition of sin? If you haven't seen Hellbound, then you'll probably enjoy Hellbound if you like this movie. It is actually a really fun show. Anyway, back to Yong Sang-ho, because he also brought to Train to Busan his previous collaborator on King of Pigs and The Fake, director of photography Lee hyung Dok. Lee wanted to keep Train to Busan's individual shots to a minimum, as well as shoot in standard 185 instead of widescreen, to keep the action dynamic but not oversaturate the screen with too much information. The majority of the action takes place in cramped, claustrophobic train carriages with zombies who feel like a genuine threat at all times. This was achieved with a variety of different shooting types, including using a GoPro strapped to a new zombie's chest and using mobile phone footage to show the raw reality of a skateboarder witnessing a zombie attack. Filming of Train to Busan began in April 2015 through to August 2015 with on-location shoots at Daejeon Station, Dongdaegu Station and Seoul. The assembled cast were put through their paces during the tough shoot. Gong Yu would admit that he thought filming would be a piece of cake, but that he struggled. That so many times the zombie actors would catch up to him, and just the overall complexity of filming action sequences with zombies. He would state in an interview that South Korean actors don't necessarily train as zombies, that other countries have specific zombie actors. Which is something that I never knew. But if Gong Yu says it, then it must be true, because why would a handsome man lie like that? Ma Dong Seok, who you may know from the Marvel movie Eternals, he's credited in that movie as Don Lee. He plays the character of Gilgamesh. He used to be Gong Yu's personal trainer. That's where that physique comes from, those arms. And unlike a Hollywood action movie, which would have its lead actor, aka Gong Yu, front and centre in the main fight scenes, Gong Yu and his character Seok Wu is sidelined for the much more capable Ma Dong Seok's Yoon Sang Hwa. And this is something that I'm going to come back to because Sang Hwa is basically the man that Seok Wu should be striving to be. Protective, caring, compassionate, and someone who always puts others before himself. Back to Yong Sang Ho, because he worked on Train to Busan and its animated prequel Soul Station concurrently, both came out in 2016, and he wanted to translate the erratic movements in Soul Station zombies over to the live-action Train to Busan. He hired choreographer Park Jae-in to create specific choreography, a bit like breakdancing, actually, and coached the human actors to be realistic zombies, including using unnatural movements, with specific reference to the movement of zombies in the video game Seven Days to Die, the movements in the anime Ghost in the Shell, which is episode 80 of this podcast, and also the nurses in Silent Hill. And the movements were different depending on the character who had been bitten. An elderly person turned into a zombie would react slower than a young person. So, for example, someone on the baseball team would react. The soldiers would be heavier and more violent zombies. Zombie scenes were extensively rehearsed to ensure all the actors knew their placements. And zombie movements were taught to nearly 100 background actors for six months. A chair and sofa were placed in the studio and tape was attached to reproduce a train layout for rehearsals of available space and placement. KTX trains are narrow compared to most trains and so for filming in the carriages themselves, a rail was laid across the top to mount the camera on to give a sense of speed and action as it could be ran up and down the carriage, either chasing the characters or being chased by the zombies. Martial arts director He Myung Hyang was responsible for the zombie stunts, which were performed in conjunction with the Seoul Action School. They are trained stunt people with a lot of experience in martial arts, but obviously zombie acting is very different. Things like if a zombie falls, 
They won't instinctively put their hands out to stop themselves like a human being would. So the stunt people had to be retrained in their natural human instinct to save themselves from a fall. And this is a movie that really does perfectly combine live action and CG zombies. And when scenes are enhanced with CG, they mostly consisted of motion capture figures of the actors as the zombies. And then they would use the CG to twist and contort their bodies unnaturally. Actors' bodies and faces were digitally scanned and the curvature of muscles and blood vessels was added in. The majority of the zombies, though, are real actors, which adds to the genuine terror that's not felt by most modern zombie movies. And I feel like I'm going to bring up World War Z a lot, and sorry for that World War Z, but Train to Busan just works better than that movie does. And I think the reason why is not only is it a great action horror movie, but it also has genuinely sympathetic villains and the ability to relate to the human characters on screen. So for Train to Busan, VFX producer Park Seong Jin and CG supervisors Kim Chan Su and Han Chan Ming were in charge of visual effects, animation, lighting and rendering. It presented new possibilities and the idea was to achieve a maximum effort within the very limited budget that this movie had, the equivalent of only $8.5 million. And I'm going to come to both of these, but the rear projection and the large-scale zombie swarm scene are typical examples of this. All in all, there are about 600 CG shots in this movie, of which there are about 170 high-level shots, such as zombies, the elk, and the train crash scenes. In terms of difficulty, Train to Busan was quite a big task for the visual effects team. Even the gravel on the train tracks in Don Daegu Station were made from scratch and coated one by one, made as a safety prop so that actors could fall on them and not get hurt. The movie begins with the appearance of a zombie elk. Kim Chan Su and Han Chang Ming put a lot of effort into the elk, creating a new 3D creature by referring to a live action video of an elk. And the 3D work goes through a lighting process that gives the appearance of light and the amount of exposure and a texture process that coats the skin and fur on the three-dimensional model. The scenery outside the windows of the trains in Train to Busan were actually filmed by the staff on the KTX from Seoul to Dongdaegu. Traditional methods like rear projection were used to depict the train movement by projecting onto two LED screens totaling 30 metres in width, which, according to visual and special effects producer Park Seong Jin, was the first time a South Korean film had ever used rear projection. Copious extras in zombie makeup were used in almost every scene, which Kwak Tae Yong wanted to make realistic and convincing. Numerous other zombie movies were referenced, and each character was designed to be at a different stage of zombification, with different colours and intensity of makeup per level of infection. Kwak described the internal train to Busan law that the speed of the infection depends on where a person is bitten. If you're bitten on your hands, the infection is slow. If you're bitten on the neck, you become a zombie quicker. Just to progress the goof of zombification occurs as fast as the plot decides it does. Not really. And I have read that on certain factions of the internet about this movie. But this is a smart movie and these guys have thought of that. Also, the idea to tape around your arms to fight zombies. Similarly genius idea. Why has no other zombie movie thought of that? Maybe they have and I've just never seen it, but it seems to make complete sense. The most difficult scenes to shoot were when the characters look at the zombies and people on the platform being attacked by them while they're in the carriage. Because the train was filmed on set, the background was filmed at Chionan Asan station, and the zombies on the platform were filmed at another station where filming was possible. These three scenes had to be filmed separately and then combined at a later date. Due to the sheer number of on-set actors needing zombie makeup, they made a, and I'm not even joking, a zombie factory. There were three booths in this zombie factory and these booths could handle the makeup effects of between 20 to 100 actors a day. Makeup calls started at 1am to meet an 8am filming time. Three staff members would adjust facial tones. To get speckled spots on pale skin, they used paint splattered on an actor's face with a toothbrush. After that, the two more people did highlight work to emphasise dark circles and scars and going through additional blood painting. They would also put on cloudy contact lenses to give you a full-on zombie feel. And of course, the zombies in these movies would have weaknesses. They have to see their prey, which means the humans could use dark tunnels to their advantage. 
Choreographer Park Jae-in planned the zombie movements like animals who depend on smell and sound instead of eyesight. Movements of the head where the ears go first in search for sound or the nose goes first in search of smell. Zombie mouths were always emphasised because that's their only weapon. In the scene where the characters are barricading the zombies behind a glass door at the station, the part where the glass breaks and the zombies pour in and pile up was created by the collaboration of three teams. The martial arts team, the special makeup team and the CG team. The people who fall through when the glass door is broken are all stunt performers trained to fall on top of each other. To save the person at the bottom of the stack, a dummy was laid at the bottom and the rest of the stunt people fell on top. This was filmed in layers for close to 10 frames and finally was synthesised by the CG team. And one of the things I really love about this movie is that it is a full-on action movie, but it's not a typical Hollywood full-on action movie. And let me explain, because in the action scenes, Ma Dong Siuk is front and centre, as I say, and the action is him being flanked by Gong Yu and with Choi Woo Sik bringing up the rear. And this was done on purpose by the filmmakers. And this was to show the sort of action that ordinary people might undertake in a zombie apocalypse, not someone like Tom Cruise or Brad Pitt or trained stunt people or professional warriors. Can you even get a professional warrior? I don't know. But the idea was that Ma Dong Siok's character, Sang Hua, is a protector by nature and that Siok Wu is not. Ma Dong Siok was placed as the starting line with those arms, using chairs as leverage to kick zombies, followed by Gong Yu with his shield and Choi Wu Sik with a baseball bat. Most of the complex shots in the movie were filmed on green screen with wire work and dummy zombies supplementing the use of real stunt people in precarious positions, such as when the train derails and zombies pour through the window. That is, again, a mix of real stunt people and also a bit of CG as well. But it still looks really great. And if you're going to use CG, you're going to use it like Train to Busan uses it, just a little bit sparingly but really take advantage of these incredible stunt people and these martial artists who really do know what they're doing. Train to Busan is a zombie movie, but it was never really marketed as one. It was instead marketed as a thriller action movie, and it is those things too. But it's also a touching story about familial relationships. It has this wonderful layered character development, and it manages to balance that with pathos and humour. This has always felt like more of a story about manhood, specifically fatherhood, amongst social diversity, where the richest are on equal footing against the zombie horde to the poorest. And it all goes back full circle to the South Korean setting. South Korea has a very intricate social structure. Conformity and social expectations, place of birth, occupation, residence, accent and clothing are all taken into account in the country's never-ending status assessments. This judgment of status arises from a complex web of historical development that has resulted in an autocratic, work-driven society where the majority of its workforce is paid a low wage, with a sizeable number of migrant labourers who are distinguished from expats in another example of hierarchy. Train to Busan uses several distinct character types to drive the social commentary, from the greedy, arrogant and selfish Yong Suk, the morally failing and complicit Siok Wu, the kind, generous and selfless working class Sang Hua and Seong Kyung, the elderly representation that it wasn't like this in our day, sisters in Gil and Jong Gil, and the youth culture represented by the whole baseball team, but mainly Jin Hee and Yong Guk. It adds another layer when you realise that Seok Woo is probably partially yet indirectly responsible for the outbreak through his greed for selling shares at a company that has had a chemical leak. Siok Wu could easily become the character of Yon Suk if it weren't for his sweet, innocent and kind daughter, an outstanding performance by Kim Soo An, a character who constantly reminds him of his guilt and his moral failings just by being the sweetest, kindest character. Siok Wu reminds her to look out for herself, but as she puts it, that's why her mother left. Siok Wu isn't a bad person by any stretch of the imagination, but he is happy to be complicit and ignore social responsibility. Suan is his moral compass, 
but he only starts to truly understand how powerful a part he plays when he sees how Sang Hua and Seong Kyung have empathy for those around them and actually do a better job of taking care of his daughter until Seok Woo actually steps up and mirrors Sang Hua's courageousness and self-sacrifice, which ends up literally saving the two characters who are most likely to die during a zombie apocalypse, the pregnant woman and the small child. Technically both the future of this world and therefore the only symbols of hope in this movie. And that's why I think it's important that both of them survive. And you might be asking the question, why is there a severe lack of guns in this movie? This is opposed to many traditional American zombie movies that tend to have a lot of firearms. And the reason for this is simple, that unlike America, only 0.2% of people carry firearms in South Korea. And that's mostly reserved for the armed forces, the police, etc. As you see at the end of the movie, the armed forces seem to have control of the zombie hordes because they have guns, but the general public would not have access to these weapons. And so that's how this infection is spreading as quickly as it is. Something else that started quite small and has spread very quickly is this podcast's obligatory Keanu reference, which started, I believe, back in episode 13 of this podcast and has just spread, infected every single episode, just gained all that traction. And now episode 179. And this is a really great obligatory Keanu reference. So if you don't know what this is, this is a part of the podcast where I try to link the movie that I'm featuring with Keanu Reeves. And honestly, I'm going to take real credit for this because this is a really good obligatory Keanu reference. So there is a restaurant in Busan called Keanu. I'm not joking. Look it up on Google. The Keanu restaurant in Busan. They serve pizza, pasta. They have an Instagram. Their food looks delicious. If I'm ever in Busan, you know where I'm going for my lunchtime meal. Honestly, what a coup to have a restaurant called Keanu in Busan for an episode on Train to Busan. It's got nothing to do with zombies, but it's got everything to do with Busan. So I'm taking that reference. I'm running with that reference. And it is one of the best ones I've ever found. Straight up. So Train to Busan premiered in the midnight screening section of the 2016 Cannes Film Festival on the 13th of May 2016. It was released wide in South Korea on the 20th of July 2016 and it stayed in the Korean top 10 for seven weeks. It would debut at number 24 in the domestic US charts when it released there on the 22nd of July 2016. But really the domestic release is not important here because this movie was such a huge hit in South Korea on a budget of the equivalent of $8.5 million dollars Train to Busan made $80.5 million in South Korea, $2.2 million in the United States and Canada, and $15.8 million in other countries for a total worldwide gross of $98.5 million, which for an $8.5 million film is a phenomenal achievement. It also became the highest grossing Korean movie in places like Malaysia, Hong Kong, Singapore, and because movie admissions in South Korea are tracked by the number of tickets sold rather than the cost of those tickets, it attracted more than 11 million moviegoers in South Korea. It was the highest grossing movie of 2016 and also is the 15th highest grossing movie of all time in South Korea. Higher than Parasite, even. That is how big this movie was in its native country. It's also critically acclaimed as well. It currently sits at 94% on Rotten Tomatoes with praise for its visuals, social commentary and emotional core. And probably the highest piece of praise that this movie ever got was from director Edgar Wright when he said on Twitter that it was, quote, the best zombie movie I've seen in forever, unquote. Train to Busan was also nominated for five Asian Film Awards, 12 Blue Dragon Film Awards, winning two for Technical Awards for Special Makeup and the Audience Choice Award for Most Popular Film. It was nominated for six Bull Film Awards, winning Best Supporting Actor for Kim Yoo Sang. He was playing businessman Yong Suk. The Yu Hyung Mok Film Arts Award and also winning Best Foreign Language Film at the Fangoria Chainsaw Awards. Now, I did say we were going to talk about remakes, but we're also going to talk about sequels 
And we're also going to talk about a prequel again as well. So there is a standalone sequel to this movie. It was called Peninsula in South Korea. Internationally, it was marketed as Train to Busan Peninsula. That came out in 2020. I have not seen that movie. I've heard that it's not as good, but then, to be honest, I don't think anything could be as good as Train to Busan, except maybe Soul Station, the animated prequel. As I said, that came out on the 18th of August 2016. That was made on a budget of $575,000, and it made $2 million. So this is a franchise that has made a ridiculous amount of money. I will be looking for Soul Station. I will be watching Soul Station. I've heard wonderful things about Soul Station. The rights to the movie's English language adaptation were purchased by French company Galmont from Next Entertainment World in 2016. The remix co-producers New Line Cinema, Atomic Monster and Coin Operated were revealed in 2018. Warner Brothers Pictures would handle global distribution with the exception of Korea. Timo Jarjanto was slated to direct the remake, produced by James Wan and Gary Dauberman, who's also adapting the screenplay for the movie. It's called The Last Train to New York. It was slated for release on the 21st of April 2023. However, Warner Brothers had taken the movie off the release schedule back in July of 2022, though, and the future of The Last Train to New York remains unknown at this stage. But to be honest, as I said last episode, if you can get past the one-inch barrier of subtitles, which, believe me, for this movie, you absolutely can and should, you have no excuse not to watch Train to Busan. We don't need an American remake of this movie. This movie is pretty perfect without that. So you've kind of figured what I think about this movie, about how much I adore it. But let's have a listen to what everyone else thinks. So I like to ask the patrons. I like to ask on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. We're going to start with the patrons as always. And we're going to start with Vern. And Vern says, Train to Busan broke me in ways I can't define. I dare anyone to watch that entire movie to not be reaching for the tissues during those last scenes. The rest is funny and thrilling, a rare horror movie that has you really invested in the characters. Grade A, I loved it and really enjoyed watching reactions to people watching it on the YouTube. And as a patron of this podcast and having a podcast himself, I'm going to let you know about Vern's podcast. So he hosts Cinema Recall and Cinema Recall loves discussing iconic moments in film. They also love cult movies, which is probably why something like Train to Busan is right up his alley. I will put some information for Cinema Recall in the show notes. I will also be going on Cinema Recall in a couple of months time. So look out for that episode. And the final patron comment comes from Pete, who says... Train to Busan is one of the best modern zombie movies, full stop. It's always fun to see how different cultures or generations execute classic horror or monster genres and Korea nailed zombies in this. Also seek out Netflix's series Kingdom for a different amazing take. And Pete's podcast is called Middle Class Film Class. It's hosted by him, Joseph and Tyler. It is a weekly movie news and reviews podcast. And Pete as a patron, was responsible for the recent episode on Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Info in the show notes for Middle Class Film Class. Moving over to Twitter, we're going to start with at Nobody Asked For Pod, who said, Easily one of the most effective zombie movies in cinema, thrilling from start to finish. At Nikolai's Kitchen said, Train to Busan is frantic, jaw-droppingly well executed and full of fantastic heart-pumping tension. Its characters are well visualised and Jang Young yus score is incredible. Then the ending hits and I legitimately sobbed my eyes out. An absolute masterpiece. At AMPP said, In my personal opinion, the best zombie movie I have ever seen and that final 10-15 to 15 minutes hits me emotionally each time. At Bergfan004 said, It is the modern benchmark of cinema by which all other films are judged. Whether or not they are trained to Busan good. At Oral underscore MFC said, Besides being scary as heck, it's beautifully shot for a horror movie and incredibly moving. The lingering deer scene, the trio triangulating as they square up for battle, and the tragic silhouette of Siok Wu's sacrifice are masterful. At the Cat Film Fan said, Saw it for the first time just last week. Controversially, I thought it was good, but felt a bit long, and the second half doesn't capture the energy and fun of the first half. Maybe a little overhyped for me. At Chatsunami Pod said, 
an absolutely fantastic take on the zombie genre that leaves you on the edge of your seat. At Chris Movie DM said, I put it right up there with Dawn of the Dead 2004 and 28 weeks later for best zombie movie ever. At Rocola Del Rolo said, I liked it, haven't watched Peninsula though. At Thief CGT says, Not to bury the lead, but it will come up in my next guest episode, The Zombie Loot. And at Bite Soho says, Brilliant film. There are actually no comments over on Instagram or Facebook for Train to Busan, which is disappointing. But huge thank you to the patrons and to everyone on Twitter for some really wonderful thoughts on Train to Busan, which, to be honest, I think Nick Haskins has it pretty spot on. An absolute masterpiece is a fair assessment as far as I'm concerned. And it's not often that Nick and I agree on movies. So the fact that Nick and I agree on something is miraculous in itself. But as always, a huge thank you to everyone who took the time to give me a comment on this episode on Train to Busan. Train to Busan is not just a zombie movie, although it excels at that. But it's also a touching story about relationships with as much pathos and humour as you can expect from a story that's also terrifying. Similarities to Bong Joon-ho's Snowpiercer and comparisons to World War Z are kind of inevitable, but Train to Busan manages to eclipse both. It takes the social commentary and class conflict of Snowpiercer, along with the train and the zombie setting of World War Z, and rise higher for it, all the while celebrating fatherhood, becoming the sort of person you want your children to be, and that it's okay to fail at parenthood sometimes as long as you make up for it. The idea that you should show your kids how to be and not tell them how to be. Make your children proud, as well as giving rich, complex characters who you actually root for and even a villain you can empathise with when you realise that through it all, he's just a scared little boy who wants to see his mother. Not only is it all of those things, it's also a story rich in social commentary, as most South Korean cinema is, commenting on class structure and specifically how the rich are valued and listened to, such as the train conductor constantly acquiescing to Yong Suk's demands, and the poor, such as the nameless homeless man, are at best ridiculed and at worst completely ignored. Ironically, he turns out to be one of the most selfless characters, sacrificing himself so that others can escape the wreckage of the train. Child actors are more missed than hit a lot of the time, but I can't stress enough how incredible Kim Soo Ahn is. For such a young age, she was only nine when she made this movie, she always feels like a real frightened little girl, desperate for her dad to do the right thing. Her performance is honest, tear-jerking, raw and profound. For her to finally find the words to her song in memory of her father at the end is heartbreaking and beautiful. Honestly, I could cry just thinking about it. This movie is so many things, but to me it boils down to how two rich, privileged men control their own narratives, Seok Woo and Yon Suk. Both are fairly interchangeable, Seok Woo could easily turn into Yon Suk, and he starts the story similarly, only looking out for himself, and by extension Su On. Yon Suk's paranoia and fear spreads among the cabin, and he poisons the other passengers against the collective heroes fighting to save their loved ones. Fear makes people do things they otherwise wouldn't, But Yon Suk doesn't care about his fellow passengers. He's very much for saving himself and himself alone. And he will sacrifice whoever he needs to to save himself. This is the individual versus the collective. And we root for the collective and each character's individual sacrifice. Instead of becoming Yon Suk, Siok Wu and Sang Hwa bond. And he strives to be more like him. And it becomes the important tale of two fathers. Death is inevitable but it's how we choose to accept it. Seok Wu chooses to become the hero he needs to be for his daughter, finally valuing her above everything else and making the ultimate sacrifice, but not before remembering his life with her before he turns. He relishes in every scrap of his newfound humanity to spend his final memories with his daughter. It's a beautiful and poignant ending for a character who could have turned out to be very different. There are lots of zombie movies out there in the world. Most of them, not really worth the time of day. This is a movie that has exceptional characters, deep themes, and is executed impeccably, as well as being socially and politically aware. But it's also a poignant celebration of life. 
that we need to make every second count. And that a character like Siok Wu, who's probably spent countless months, weeks, years, not really paying attention to his daughter, now realises what he's missed out on. So really, I think the lasting takeaway from this movie is prepare for the zombie apocalypse, but don't ignore what you have right in front of you. And be more like Sang Hua. Thank you for listening. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts on Train to Busan. If you've enjoyed this episode and you want to get involved and you want your comments read out in a future episode, watch out on a Saturday for the comments posts that go up on social media for the next episode. Put in a comment and I will read it out and I will credit you for that comment too. You can also get involved by leaving a rating or review wherever you found this podcast. You can go on social media, should tell you where I am probably, at Verbal Diorama on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and Letterboxd. You can like posts on those accounts, you can retweet them on Twitter. It all helps to make this podcast more visible. Or the easiest thing you can do is tell a friend or a family member about this podcast, especially if they're a fan of Train to Busan. And if you like this episode on Train to Busan, I'm going to recommend some movies slash episodes that I think you would also like. So I'm going to recommend episode 80, Ghost in the Shell. Now, obviously, it's not a zombie movie, but they did reference the movements of the animation in this movie. And it's a wonderful anime. It's one of the most defining animes of all time. And I'm never not going to recommend that you watch Ghost in the Shell. It also was a huge inspiration for The Matrix as well. So if you like The Matrix, you probably like Ghost in the Shell too. Episode 135, Corpse Bride, because zombies corpses are zombies and i recommended it last episode too and it is genuinely one of the most popular episodes of this podcast ever so people love corpse bride and if you've not seen corpse bride then you should watch corpse bride it's stop motion animation it's absolutely beautiful it is a tim burton movie it's also a Leica movie as well please check out corpse bride it's lovely and the previous episode 178 one cut of the dead because it's the only other zombie movie I've ever covered and if you've not seen One Cut of the Dead you should absolutely watch that movie before you listen to the episode I can't stress that enough give me feedback let me know what you thought of my recommendations so the next episode I'm doing a month purely focusing on foreign horror this October and the next episode we're going to be moving to Sweden for a sweet vicious vampire story also recently remade by Hollywood but the Swedish original stands above and beyond for me. It is Let the Right One In. It's a movie I've not seen for a while, actually, so I'm really excited to see that. That will be coming in two weeks' time because I'm going to be taking a little break this month. But in two weeks, please come back for Let the Right One In. This podcast is free and it always will be free for everyone. But if you do want to help support this podcast, you want to help me buy amazing new equipment, such as the brand new laptop I've just bought. It's all thanks to the amazing patrons of this podcast. And I like to say thank you to them every episode. So thank you, Simon E, Sade, Claudia, Simon B, Laurel, Derek, Vern, Kristin, Kat, Andy, Mike, Griff, Luke, Emily, Michael, Scott, Brendan, Ian, Lisa, Sam, Will, Jack, Dave, Chris, Stuart, Sonny, Drew, Nicholas, Zoe, Kev, Pete, Heather and Danny. Gong Yu levels of attractive love to you all. That is a thing, by the way. Gong Yu levels of attractive love. <laughs> That's like the highest levels of love. Gong Yu attractive level. <laughs> I have a merch store. It's verbaldiorama.com slash merch. If you're interested, you can get in touch with me. You can say hi. You can give me feedback or suggestions by emailing verbaldiorama at gmail.com or you can visit the website verbaldiorama.com. And I'm still at filmstories.co.uk. You can check out the magazine, which I write for, and the articles online, a couple of which are also written by me every week. And how else can I finish this episode other than this? And finally...
Bye. Move it, you know.